Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan Rice, and I'm a Chief Executive of Perspectiva that's hosting tonight's event. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. Um, I can see you coming in from a wide variety of places. Um, tonight is the eighth uh, event in this series of Attention as a Moral Act, which focuses on Ian's book, The Matter with Things. And uh, it will be the for now, the last uh, until after the summer. So tonight's going to be the kind of um, the eighth and then we're going to take a break for, um, we'll see, until the autumn. And we'll clarify in the meantime, the dates and the speakers for what, what's likely to be the last four events. But we're having a break partly because, well, we need breaks, um, partly to give Ian a break. He speaks a great deal. Um, he has shown up every every second week like clockwork on this series, but it's now time to give us a break, give Ian a break, and give the audience, especially loyal followers of this series, of which there are probably at least a hundred, if not hundreds. Um, so thank you. Um, and it's really a pleasure to end with this particular one. It's not not a it's a pause rather than an end, but you know, to end this phase of things with Rupert Reed. Um, now, there are lots of biographies of Rupert Reed online that you anyone with a Google functionality can check. But let me say something a little more personal because it's always more interesting. Um, Rupert is known to most people as an environmental activist, and many encounter him, for example, on Question Time uh, as a spokesman for Extinction Rebellion. Uh, more recently, debating different kinds of strategy for um, various kinds of protest, Just Stop Oil, for example. Um, and um, people also know him perhaps as a Green Party spokesman. He was a politically active in the Green Party for a long time. But what's less well known, I think, is that Rupert is also a philosopher of some renown and experience and for many years has written and taught um, particularly on the work of Wittgenstein, but philosophy more generally. I believe he taught a very popular course on the philosophy of film, for example. Um, and um, this side of him is very important for tonight's event because like Ian, Rupert has moments of despair at the world um, in which he feels um, that we are deluded and that we risk destroying our only home. Indeed, that it's already underway. Um, but what's also interesting is that as a philosopher, while he, I think it's fair to say, and he'll put it in his own words later, very much admires Ian, Ian's work, there's also certain nuances and points of emphasis that I think he wants to sort of query Ian on. And the way to understand why that matters is that I think both Ian and Rupert have a, some sense of the clock ticking, that there's a sort of urgency to wake up to our delusions, to attend to the world differently, um, and through that difference in attention, remake the world. Um, Ian speaks about the unmaking of the world in the title, so the corollary of that is what does it mean to not not to unmake it, to keep it, to protect it, to restore it, to renew it, and so on. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, um, what I'm keen to understand from tonight's event, and I've shared as much with Rupert and Ian, is now that Rupert has Ian's attention for an hour, um, <laughs> how how would he how would he and he's had that before, I guess. But how would he like to um, challenge Ian in a way that makes it clear what what we need from Ian's work, what we need people to understand from Ian's work that is critically important ecologically, but perhaps more than that, what Ian himself may come to understand better or think differently about as a result of Rupert's interpretation, because although Rupert's a philosopher, he's he's encountering reality from first principles, like any good philosopher. He's trying to make sense of the world through truth, wisdom, and so on. But maybe Ian is perhaps um, less of an activist, less out there with the megaphone, telling people that we have a certain amount of time left. So it's an interesting encounter to clarify what's going on philosophically vis-a-vis -vis the clock ticking that we most need to understand. And that's how I see the scene for you both. Mm. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you both. And I'll hopefully be able to ask 
a question later. But for now, thanks a lot and good luck. Bye. Cool. Thank thanks, you. Jonathan. Yeah, superstar. I could say something about the clock ticking. Uh, as I do very much uh, see the clock as ticking, as I think you do, Ian. Um, sure. I, I think of uh, the marvellous line that gets repeatedly used in uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the hour is late. Uh, in fact, what we say in the Climate Majority Project, which uh, I'm launching this month, a much more moderate mm. kind of successor to uh, Extinction Rebellion, um, is that uh, the hour is so late that it's uh, it's past midnight. There's this metaphor that keeps on being used about the climate and ecological situation, which is it's five to midnight, we're running out of time. Uh, and what we want to say is no, actually, in a certain sense, we've already run out of time. What we run out of time for is the fantasy that we can carry on uh, in anything like the way we are doing. Uh, mm. There is going to be a transformation coming. The question before is, is, is it going to be the right kind of transformation uh, or not? Uh, to connect that immediately with, with an aspect of your work, Ian, um, one might say something like this. This is an incredibly crude remark, but uh, it, it points to something. <laughs> caring about uh, social justice. <laughs> caring about yeah. social justice is important, but it's the kind of thing that most closely correlates to what you call the left hemisphere. Whereas caring about the planet perhaps intrinsically inclines us to the right hemisphere. And that's got something to do with the way mm. it seems to me that we are forced to change our attention when, for example, we immerse ourselves in nature. Uh, and something about this, this crucial ecological dimension and the non-negotiability of it and, and thinking of ecology and not just climate, by the way, um, again, makes me think of uh, of your work and, and something that I feel that many of us get from it. Mm. Was that a, a, a question of a kind? Do, do, do I think that social justice is a left hemisphere um, concern and, and that the environment, or as I prefer to call it, nature is a right hemisphere concern? Was that... Yeah, the, the, not 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 as kind of you know that's obviously far no. rude, but, but that yes, there is yes. something in that that there is a way mm. in which um, concern about the planet and nature and so on um, mm. more kind of uh, tellingly and definitively um, links us with what you call uh, the right hemisphere than does concern mm. about social justice. Well, I. I... One clear contrast is between the nature of our concerns about climate change, the destruction of the forests, the poisoning of the oceans and the rest of what we're doing to the natural world, which is very clear and, um, you know, we know what we're talking about there. But when you come to social justice, it's a, it's a very nebulous term which can be annexed by various different causes. And if it boils down to being compassionate and and fair to people who are being treated um, without compassion and without um, justice, then it's equally a, a right hemisphere concern because mm -hmm. the right hemisphere is the one in which we see ourselves as bound to society. And you know, in brief, one of the things that that I say about our predicament at the moment is that the three things that make us fully human and make us fulfilled are absent. One is belonging to a cohesive social group in which we understand one another, respect one another, share our lives together, perhaps perform rituals together, but in any case have a cohesive sense of belonging. Then yeah. the natural world and our belonging in that, and finally the spiritual world and our belonging in that, and all three of those seem to me to be better understood by the right hemisphere's way of uh, disposing its attention to the world than that of the left. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, whereas, as you implied, um, although you and I have sometimes disagreed a little about the importance of uh, equality between humans in the past, what we can, I think, safely say is that there are some ways of attaching 
to the concept of equality, which are problematic and uh, and left hemispherical. Um, yeah. And that sometimes is what people um, uh, end up meaning by social justice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to also make a, a, a personal um, remark at this point, um, thinking of uh, one or two of the things that Jonathan said in his helpful introduction, that uh, many of you will be aware, many of you will not be aware that I'm about to leave uh, academia. I'm about to no longer be a professional uh, paid up uh, philosopher. And mm, I, I think- I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't know that, yeah. So I'm no, leaving- no, no. I'm, I'm leaving the University of Sanglia this uh, summer for complex reasons, but uh, one of the central reasons is simply that I want to devote more time to the Climate Majority uh, Project and uh, my other related uh, work. But there is also a kind of um, a factor which has got a little bit to do with you, Ian, uh, which is that um, <laughs> one of the things that uh, has has most uh, impressed me about your work and most influenced me is what I take to be an implicit critique across all of your work, but especially, I think, in The Master and His Emissary of the way that our academic institutions are in the world today. To put it extremely uh, simply, once again, um, there is a left hemisphere bias in the academy and it's really, really problematic. And reading your work has helped me to see that incredibly clearly. And I'm afraid it's uh, contributed to souring a little my relationship mm -hmm. with the uh, Academy and making me have made, has, has made me think that um, being in university is less of a kind of purely wonderful thing than than for the first mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years or so that I was in university. Yes, I thought it was. Um, with yeah. the hyper specialization and the hyper um, scholarship and the inclination towards mechanism and the disinclination towards spirituality and and on and on and on. I really felt yes. reading Master in his emissary that the scales were falling from my eyes about uh, those things. So I've got you to some extent, perhaps, to thank for the fact that I'm making this oh. <laughs> wonderful, fateful choice this year. <laughs> <laughs> or blame. Um, yes. I, I think it's a good but thing. I, I'm confident. You I, 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 Good. Well, I'm. I'm actually. I'm delighted in one way, and and you know, enormously feel for you. I understand exactly what you're talking about, and I really hope. I mean, it's an act of courage, and we need such acts of courage. And I think people are voting with their feet, and mm. the more institutions become mediocre, bureaucratic, bound by dogma and and by routine and procedure rather than by true intellectual fire and spiritual understanding, then I think people will leave them. And I already think that many of the most interesting voices are coming from the periphery of academia, not from the center of it. Yeah, yeah. And also, I think from um, think tank type institutions, uh, such as yes. Perspectiva, such as the Climate Majority Project is aiming to be, we're not just going to be a campaign. Mm organization uh we're also going to be a kind of incubator and we are a kind of think tank uh and yes. uh, yeah mm. i guess we're we're very proud of and uh, uh intent on that dimension of what we're trying to 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 bring here uh, and we suspect that the kind of thinking that we're bringing is now on balance easier to do outside the academy than inside it yes yes well, I, I think that's, a, I, I hope it, it works for you, but I think it's a step in the right direction from a you know point of view of everything that you and I believe. So yeah, yeah, well done. <laughs> and I hope you feel the feel a loosening of the shackles. I, I've moved on from sort of mainstream organizations a number of times from big colleges, from big hospitals. And whenever I've done so, I've found my life has opened up more. So that's good. Yes, I, I, so far I'm feeling that, although I haven't actually left yet, so uh, <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well now, um, what of the many further substantive things that we could talk about, shall we talk about? I, I'm struck yeah. by your wonderful uh, mentioning of those kinds of uh, belonging uh, and the um, crucialness of the ecological uh, kind and the crucialness of the, the spiritual kind. Uh, and I'm inclined mm. to think that... Uh, we should talk a bit about uh, what we might call a sort of 
uh, spiritual uh, dimension to or potential aspects of uh, your work and of arguments and discussions that we could have uh, mm. around it. Mm. Um, so let me try to frame one or two things, that, one or two questions that, uh, as you know, mm. I have in relation to your work from a sort of broadly spiritual dimension, um, especially perhaps from uh, Buddhism, which is a, a big part of uh, my own um, yes. spiritual practice. Yes. So let's take the um, the uh, idea of, well, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Um <laughs> What if uh, I were to say to you, Ian, that sometimes in your work, it seems as though you're a little hard on uh, the poor old left hemisphere, um, yeah. that uh, you, you make it seem as though um, one has to choose uh, between the two uh, and that mm. one should, um, whenever one has to choose, which one does, choose the the right hemisphere i'll give you a little quote from a, a, a mm. yours in resurgence recently um uh, you you say this each hemisphere takes a different view of the world and those views are not strictly compatible so when we reflect philosophize or discourse publicly we are pretty much forced without knowing it to favor one take or the other no room for yes but no room for nuance or for seeing the hidden opposite that is always present in whatever is being peddled to us and I guess that when I read that, I was a little surprised by how firm uh, you were there in saying no room for nuance there. Um, what if I would... Well, of course, what I, what I didn't mean was that there should be no room. I believe passionately there must be. What I was saying, in case there's any ambiguity, was that the world we live in now has no room for yes, but and no room for the nuance, which I think is all important. But but what I'm interested in is the moment in the paragraph when you say those views are not strictly compatible. So it seems as though you that's, do that's think okay. that we are forced to favour one take or the other. Is that not right? Yes. I, no, no, that is right. Um, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong, as it were, intrinsically with the left hemisphere. And of course, it certainly doesn't mean we'd be better off without it. Um, we, we rely on it. There's a very good reason why, um, through evolution, this compartmentalization, if you like, of, of neural activity has, has, has um, come about. And I, I think my point is, if I sometimes seem rather down on the left hemisphere, it's because um, I know that it's the, the mode of vision that is inculcated in us automatically through our society and through our education, although many, many people feel the importance of something else that they say, you know, I'd always thought that certain things were important truths, but could find no way of expressing them. And you both alerted me to their reality and gave me a way of championing them and so on. So um, what I'm trying to do is correct an imbalance. Yeah. What I'm not, say what I'm not saying, though, is that they're equally valuable. And, yeah. and this, is, um, a, this is a problem nowadays because we automatically assume that if there are two, they must be equally valuable, but they may not be. And they may both be necessary without them being equally valuable. And so uh, what, I, what I would say is that we, we need to honor the points of view of both, but when we're trying to finally make a decision, it's okay to allow what we know about which, um, which vision, as it were, we're being presented with, um, and, and to take that into account. And I, I, if I just explain briefly, I think this is important because I hope it's not um, hubristic to say that it could mean that there is a step forward in philosophy. In, mm. in, that in the past, we've just said, well, you know, one school of philosophy says this, another school of philosophy says that, take your pick. And they've been argued about for 2000 years, so we're not going to come to a conclusion. But what I think I can add to this is to say, I can see the hallmark of the left hemisphere at work and I can see the hallmark of the right hemisphere's broader vision. And if we have to make decisions about which way we're going to, to lean, I think it's wise to lean towards the one that tends to be more veridical 
and, and I mean that in a very literal sense, which is why the whole of part one is on neuropsychology and why I demonstrate that whatever it is you're looking at, the left hemisphere can be shown, demonstrated scientifically, to be more likely to be deluded than the right. Yes, although that only follows if we um, allow ourselves to separate and split off the hemispheres from each other, right? I mean, the sense... But I think which... that's what we're doing, if you see what I mean. My argument is the left hemisphere is a good servant, but not a good master. In our society, yeah. it's become the master. Yeah, but shouldn't we always seek to, to uh, remain clear on the point that the hemispheres are... Uh, are parts of uh, a whole. If we don't remain clear on that, then we always risk a, a sort of fallacy of decomposition or a homuncular. I, 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 yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, no, that is one of the one of the first things that I always say about this is that, of course, in real life, we're always using both. But there is a sense in which when we stand back from headlong living and reflect on the world, we belong to a world in which contradicting yourself is considered one of the prime sins and shows you up as not having thought clearly. But I believe that actually, if you think clearly about the world, you will see that often opposites are both necessary and both need to be taken into account. Our logic um, makes that very difficult. Um, the answer comes back from the left hemisphere does not compute. But in fact, we need to be able to hold two things that appear superficially to be incompatible, and at some level are incompatible, but to hold them both without allowing it to collapse into just one or the other. Yes, yes. Let me ask this question, though. What, you often talk about how useful the left hemisphere is. Why is it so very uh, useful? I think that's a fairly simple question to answer. It aids survival in a very obvious sense. That it but why does it aid to... survival? Uh, why, do, it, sh so doesn't that suggest that it must be tracking something? It is. It, it's there in order to enable us to grab food, grab stuff, make tools, manipulate the world. But, but, we might, but, under... we, but mightn't we equally well say about it's tracking something that it's uh, it's there to enable us to uh, to appreciate you know what those uh, beings are whether they are predators or prey and so on and so forth. In other words, what I'm trying to get at is, isn't it important that we acknowledge and are clear about a sense in which the left hemisphere over and over again gives us truths? Well, I, I would I would <clears throat> demur or want to qualify that considerably. There's a difference between being useful and being truthful. Well, what I'm getting at is, um, can we make sense of a consistent uh, usefulness which doesn't have any connection with truthfulness? It, the, the can, there can be such things, yes, definitely. It well, can be very useful. Why is it consistent then? Why, is it, why does it go on and on? Why, why doesn't it just run out? Why doesn't what run out? I don't quite the, understand. The, 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 the usefulness. Well, <clears throat> if, you, if you think about it philosoph from a philosophical point of view, utility on its own is in fact useless because the question is utility for what? And unless there's another value than sheer utility behind utility, um, the, 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 the utility itself is a futility, um, as I sometimes put it. So, yeah. um, yes, there are other things, but, you know, we take it as a good thing that we can eat and stay warm and, and, and do all those things. They're very important. Um, the ways in which they're achieved may have very little to do with the search for truth, may, may be mainly to do with the search for stuff and a certain way of manipulating the world. And, you know, it's kind of important, I think, again, to emphasize the difference between knowing how to manipulate something and knowing what you're doing. I've recently been having this conversation with Michael Levin, who you may know is um, a developmental biologist at Tufts. Yes. And he's very interested in, in the philosophy of, of biology. Um, and, and I think one of the, the most interesting biologists on, on that area. And <clears throat> he was saying, but if I know how to intervene in um, a growing organism and cause it to have um, you know, five legs instead of four, 
and I know I know what is causing what, but I, I, I'm not convinced of that. <laughs> it doesn't tell us. It tells us that if you do X, Y follows, but it doesn't tell you why that happens or how the whole organism is constructed. The the idea that it's simply constructed of um, you know, A leads to B kind of um, sequential mechanisms would be a false conclusion in trying to understand the whole. And it's really the story of the master's, the sorcerer's apprentice who knew what to say, but didn't really understand what he was doing or how to reverse it. Yes. I guess what I was trying to suggest before is that um, if we if we think about if we come at this from the perspective of say what buddhism says about this sort of thing one of the things it says is um is there are two truths or there are two kinds of truth right there's mm -hmm. the doctrine of the two truths so you have conventional truths and you have um ultimate truths and i think what levin mm -hmm. is talking about is conventional truths um mm -hmm. and uh, and i want to say two things i want to say firstly it's really important to, and they're related. Firstly, it's really important to acknowledge that conventional truths are a kind of truth. Uh, and secondly, that we have to be very, very careful if we want to, um, as we will, um, render the ultimate truths superior to the conventional truths. Now, clearly there's a certain sense, and this is a sense in which, you, in which you're very interested, in which ultimate truths are superior to conventional truths. That's why we call them ultimate truths. Um, but the danger is if we use the standpoint of ultimate truth, which I'm you know, roughly correlating here with what you see as the standpoint of the, the right hemisphere, if we use that as a platform from which to dis relative truths, then we're caught in um, a, a sort of performative contradiction. Because for the same kind of reason that if somebody says, goes around saying, for example, I'm a completely good person or I'm completely sane, um, we should be suspicious of them. Not just because it's tactless to say that, but because what such remarks show is that yeah. there is ego present such that it's just not true that you are uh, a completely good person or completely sane if you say those kinds of uh, uh, things in the same kind of way the worry about the self-aggrandizement of the right hemisphere uh, and the way that sometimes it appears as though you're wanting to kind of render it sort of categorically superior to the left hemisphere is that it's the same kind of issue that it's the ultimate trying to say to the conventional you're not as good as me and as soon as the ultimate can't start saying that it's it's self-defeated well, there's quite a lot to say about that um one thing that would help would be to have a clear definition of exactly what it comes under the heading conventional truth but maybe we can park that for the moment um certainly i have never said that the right hemisphere sort of as it were has access to ultimate truths what i'm suggesting is that it's more likely to reach them than the left hemisphere and part of that is because precisely it is not self-aggrandizing it does realize the limits of its understanding and the left hemisphere is literally self-aggrandizing when you isolate it and interrogate it it's very pompous and full of itself and, um, and believes it knows everything so the left hemisphere is a worry for exactly the reasons that you brought forward that it thinks it knows far yeah. more than it does yeah, and, and you know the, the the great value of the right hemisphere is that it's opening to possibilities. The right hemisphere is not saying I've got it. It's certain these are the ultimate truths. Not a bit. I'm not saying that. That's nothing to do with the argument. What it does do is it opens up to possibilities that have been closed down by the left hemisphere's desire to have pinpointed something and got it at last. Yes. Can I give you a little quote from? page 491 of uh, of uh, volume one of the matter with things um okay. and th this is the the lovely passage where you're um where you're talking about sitting where you are in your in your home where of course i've i've been uh and you say yes. from where i'm sitting i see the mountains of sky and do over the water 
If a time-lapse camera had been set up to record this scene from the origins of the world to the Earth's eventual destruction, we would see these emblems of enduring facticity rise quickly like waves and then more slowly fall away into nothingness. The most, the most solid looking man-made objects in the world, say the pyramids of Giza are quicker smaller waves, but waves they are. It's yes. that kind of moment that slightly concerns me when you say, but waves they are. That seems to me to be saying the right hemisphere has has uh, got it right. We're able to actually say uh, how um, the world is in a way that uh, defeats the everyday perspective. Well, clearly we are. Um, physicists are doing this all the time. So it is possible to... Um, be able to say that we can show certain things about reality. I know there are limits to what physics can demonstrate. I, I, I quite understand that. But nonetheless, that wouldn't necessarily be what the common sense view would be. So what I'm really saying is two things. I don't want to resile from the idea that the right hemisphere is a better um, uh, uh, witness to the truth, if you like. I'm just saying that it, it, it it's not so foolhardy and when you follow it you don't think that you've got it all but it is i think as i've tried to demonstrate over the first 400 pages of the book repeatedly in every respect that you can come at except the one of procuring stuff grabbing things it is inferior to the right hemisphere in actually understanding what it's dealing with and one way it might be um un, un, um unable to access an important truth <clears throat> is being unable to see that things are in process. I, I hmm. uh, we, we may differ about this, but I'm a, um, a follower of a sort of tradition of process philosophy. And in it, I think that all the things that we take for static objects are in fact better seen as parts of a process over a much longer time span. Yeah, but you can see the potential risk there, right? Uh, that uh, And this, of course, is connected with your wish to make progress in philosophy, which as uh, a follower of Wittgenstein, I am genitally a little bit um, suspicious of, that it does okay. then start to sound as though what you're saying is, we think that these uh, things are things, but really they are um, processes. Uh, and that is the what you call the right hemisphere, staking a claim to know how things are, and it does seem to me to mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. be worrying from okay. a broadly Wittgensteinian standpoint. Also, I would say from a Heideggerian standpoint, potentially, which I know you 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 mm -hmm. very much wish to be uh, close to. But Heidegger talks about unconcealing, um, and what mm -hmm. I think he's trying to do when he talks about unconcealing is is suggesting that in the way you suggested, and I agree with you, half an hour or so ago, what we're really what we really ought to be doing is trying to provide a kind of correction. But the correction, mm. as I see it, is not to the right answer. It's away from um, problematic tendencies. And what gets unconcealed, mm. they're not something that can be um, assertorically uh, stated. Uh, and that, I think, is the, is the great mm. lesson, possibly from Heidegger, certainly from Wittgenstein, and also certainly from great uh, wisdom traditions from many Buddhist thinkers, yeah. from Vasubandhu, uh, etc. Yeah, I mean, the difficulty I find is that you're describing exactly my position and then saying something against it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, uh, but it'll be great if we end up uh, not actually disagreeing, uh, yeah, so let's see. Well, I don't, think we, I don't think we need to. I mean, my philosophy is certainly one of uncertainty <laughs> yeah. and um it, in fact um in in a sort of koan i think i'd say the only certainty is anyone who thinks they've got certainty is certainly wrong so mm. um, I, I, i'm i'm certainly not um pursuing that particular line i'm talking about the opening up to possibility um and which is the unconcealing of things that were before hidden and hidden by presumptions, assumptions, um, presuppositions of a certain um, mode of operation, which I would associate strongly with the left hemisphere. So this idea is, I think, consonant with all of those. I, I, to go back to the Wittgenstein one, I know Wittgenstein would say there's a worry when we say that something, um, well, I'm paraphrasing, 
Yeah. <clears throat> and correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but that he would think that if we produce a philosophy which denies the way in which we normally talk about the world, we've got to face up to the fact that something may be wrong with this. And, and, and so if that's the case, I, 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 I really believe this, but I think it's different from what I'm saying, which is that I have nothing against things. In fact, I state very emphatically near the beginning of the book, um, in the very first few pages, I have nothing against things or people using the word things, as long as they realize that these so-called things can be seen as relations and processes. Now, these are different ways of looking at it. And I, I would go so far as to say that some of those ways, for example, particularly relations, but also processes, are more fruitful ways of coming to an understanding of what we're dealing with than the word thing, unless we're willing to qualify the word thing, which we're open to do, in such a way as to take into account that it is in fact um, not static, it is changing, it is a process, and it in involves a two-way relationship. <clears throat> so if one says that, um, I'm fine. But one of my arguments with um, Donald Hoffman, who, who I, I respect, is that he says that he can show that time doesn't exist. But my response to that is that if you if you adopt a position which makes something so absolutely central to experience mm. um, a, a fiction, you've pulled the rug from under any further possible inquiry. Uh, you certainly pulled the rug from under science because science is empirical. And if you take if you say, I've proved that time doesn't exist, then really we can't talk, we can't act, nothing that exists in this world can be imagined without time. It would just all glom into some great big ball. So um, I agree with you on that aspect of we mustn't sort of willfully talk away aspects of the world, but what I'm trying to do is not do that, but to help us reconfigure, to unconceal, to rediscover um, the nature of reality, and that it, uh, the way of thinking of it as composed of entities we call things is not perhaps the best way of doing it. So you mentioned the fruitfulness of the right hemisphere, and I think the reason yeah. you talk that way is because you're trying not to um, make this dogmatic claim that I'm nervous that you might be actually making, that it's about, you know, how things how things definitively are. But if you're not making that dogmatic claim, then what's the difference between fruitfulness and usefulness? A good question. Um, I'm certainly not, to repeat, making the claim that the right hemisphere has got it all figured out, and I really can't repeat what I've said any more clearly than that. But what I think I mean by fruitful is that it leads us to further disclosures that enable us to see something that we respond to as likely to be true. So truth is a relationship, I argue, mm. and not a thing. So it's not a sort of event or a, a, an element that's out there separate from us. It's, um, it's a relationship, a coming into a faithful relationship with reality, however we do that. And one of the ways we do that is through experience, through questioning our experience, through using different models to understand our experience. And I think most people would, would, would say from their own experience that as they get older, they change the models with which they look at the world. They sophisticate those models. They think differently about the nature of reality. They may have a conversion to Buddhism, which changes their, their view, of, which might have been a reductive materialist position prior to that. And so really, um, what I'm saying by fruitful is leads you to a position which explains more is truer to a greater extent to the world as we um, experience it deeply. Mm, mm. I mean, I guess the I guess I we we could try to unpack what you mean by um, faithful relation. And again, I'd be worried that there might be a sort of ambiguity there between a sort of claim hard claim of truth or something which doesn't look so very different necessarily from what uh, the left hemisphere um, um, offers. But but let's take up the, the thought of um, um, the of fruitfulness um, being about kind of opening us to new possibilities. And this is a kind of uh, process in which 
um, our brains and the world move in this kind of dance of attention and so forth. You sometimes yes. speak in of um, of the movement that we need being from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere back to the right hemisphere uh, again. They do. Worry that that move gets truncated after the left hemisphere. But actually, yes. in terms of what you're saying about um, being in the dance with the world and so on, isn't actually the better way to think about it that it's actually a move from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. In other words, it's just this never ending dance. And isn't the very idea of ending it at one place or another, whether that be the right or the left hemisphere, uh, a kind of left hemispheric idea? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, the, ultimately, I agree that um, one shouldn't truncate the process because the left hemisphere can have more to say and that can be incorporated. One very important point is that the right hemisphere can understand and incorporate what the left hemisphere knows, but the left hemisphere can't understand or incorporate what the right hemisphere knows because it's got a restricted vision. So there's that. Yeah, but, but, there's but we also... have agreed that really we're, we're, we're holes, right? We're, we're, we are holes. We're, we are holes, but can I just, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll come back to that point. But I think the thing here is that, you know, the image I've used so often, I don't want to repeat it, but there we go, is, you know, you, you, you're attracted to a piece of music in a right hemisphere way, you start to play it, you have to break it down, practice it, fragment it, theorize about it. But then when you go on the stage, you perform it. And at that point, whatever it was that the left hemisphere contributed has receded. So these Hegelian processes do sometimes stop at around there. I mean, it's also true that you can go away and practice some more and then come back and perhaps give an even better performance or perhaps give a worse performance because you've practiced too much. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that although theoretically there, this dance can go on for as long as you particularly need to or find it fruitful, the, the, the main thrust of it is this shape overall, that the right trumps the left, if I can put it that way. The danger in saying right, left, right, left, and forever, is that that makes it sound as though they're equal partners in contribution, but they're not. The left hemisphere can contribute only small parts. And, and to say, you know, just to come back to the idea of, um, you know, whether the right hemisphere has got hold of truth, since I see truth as a never ending process of a relationship that we do in our lives, and we get perhaps, if we're lucky and wise, closer to some vision of truth or some knowledge of truth, um, then of course it can't be that the right hemisphere has got it or anything like that. But if you, if you, and, and you said, and I think this is the one I wanted to come back to, yeah. is but we agreed earlier that we're always functioning as the two. Well, yes, we are, but <clears throat> when you see people who've got one half of the brain in somehow, somehow impaired, perhaps by a stroke or by an injury or whatever, and you can now do this um, painlessly in, in the lab by using TMS, but w whatever, if you do that, then you do find very different yeah. pictures of life. And th in those pictures of life don't just look like, weird i mean i don't know where all that comes from whenever people read that they go oh my god you know it's x that i know <laughs> so you do find people who do talk as though the world were constructed in this left hemisphere way now the Absolutely, difficulty yes. with this and the difficulty with a society like ours is that much discussion about reality is abstract and carried on in this way that you and I are talking, whereas in the past it would have gone on, as it were, at a much more local and more intuitive and implicit and less explicit way, in which intuitive knowledge, understanding from tradition, from nature, from culture, from what one knew of one's embodied mm -hmm. existence, all of that would have played in. And I recently came across a remark of Whitehead's that I thought was Fascinating. I, I hadn't known it before, but he said a civilization thrives up to the point where it begins to analyze itself. Hmm. And, I, 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 and that's actually quite Wittgensteinian, isn't it? Yes. I, I, well, I think it is. Yes. yes. And, um, and, and I think this is our problem that we now have decided that the wise way to think is to analyze. And when you do, you end up with a very crude, bureaucratic, 
um, artificial way of thinking about the world, which is purely cognitivist and has lost all its body and soul. Yes. But is there not a danger that is inherent to the uh, endeavour of um, making these things uh, clear um, that uh, we'll repeat um, the same manoeuvre? Um, isn't there something interesting, for example, about the fact that uh, that Wittgenstein and Heidegger and Vazabandu and Nagarjuna and, and other um, great thinkers who have wrestled with these kinds of things all in their own way um, wrote in uh, in radically um, different uh, ways from the normal, from anything like the analytical. Is there a risk, yes. Ian, that, uh, that your work um, actually engages in a sort of gigantic explicitization of the implicit? Yes, there is. <clears throat> and it's a risk I've taken knowing that only by taking it could I help to get a message across to people who otherwise wouldn't see what on earth I was talking about. So uh, people sometimes say, well, you employ your left hemisphere a great deal in these books. And I do, and I believe in clarity of expression, a careful use of language, um, you know, finding, uh, quoting your sources and all the rest. And I, I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm fairly thorough in those respects. Um, but what it, that is all in the service of the right hemisphere. And this is, in fact, the correct image that the left hemisphere should act in service of the right hemisphere, because the right hemisphere sees and knows more. So uh, while it's a danger, I, I'm not particularly concerned about it, because um, only somebody who couldn't see beyond their nose would say, well, this is terribly reductionist. I mean, there are one or two notable cases of people who said this is reductionist, but I don't think they've understood what I'm doing by looking at the brain. I'm not reducing things to the brain at all. I'm using the brain as an indicator of something. And simply to come back to your, your mystics, um, you know, many of whom I obviously also um, admire, and, and in chapter 28 of The Matter With Things, um, I draw on, on the mystical tradition of West and East. Um, it's the mystics, I believe, who see these truths. And the left hemisphere is not very good at understanding mysticism at all, because it doesn't compute. But the right hemisphere is more able to see that it can hold contraries together and to see so many different aspects of the world as revealed by a mystical tradition, that I think it's fair to say the right hemisphere is going to do a better job in helping us understand it. And what I like about my work is, in other words, what I find consoling about it, what mm -hmm. I find helps me think that I might be onto something, is that from neurology, on one hand, from philosophy on another, and from physics on a third, as you drill towards the center of this sphere, you find very much the same sorts of conclusions, I think. Biology and as well, what, right? Biology as well. And what's and now, yes, because finally biology is caught, caught mm -hmm. on. But, um, the, um, but what is also especially good is that these conclusions are often known, if you like, to people, mil, millions, well, possibly, but anyway, I, I'm concerned then with people who are a, a thousand or two years um, ago. And it's very comforting to find that, generally speaking, these paths, which look like good paths to pursue, lead, generally speaking, to a very similar place and similar yeah. conclusions. But it does seem to me that there's something a little curious going on now, because on the one hand, we have uh, Wittgenstein and Heidegger and, and these mystics writing in these, in these uh, very, as one might put it, right hemispherical uh, ways. Um, and you wanting to, to um, if you will, um, uh, assert and show and prove and clarify uh, the superiority of, uh, in a certain important sense, as you see it, of the of these uh, of this right hemispherical perspective, but as you said, the way that you do it is actually by using um, your left hemisphere, if you will, um, absolutely thoroughly and exhaustively, which might seem to be um, 
uh, an example uh, and on and on and on and it, it kind of never stops right it's not as if for example you've got to the point now saying i'm not going to do this any longer i'm simply going to start you know quoting poetic verses or something um that might seem to me that might seem to sound like what i was gesturing at a few minutes ago when i talked about well isn't there actually just this kind of endless dance of right left right left right left and you never get to the point of kind of stopping uh, with the right uh, uh, and and the, of the, yeah, I mean, what do you make of that thought? Oh, several things really. Um, w one is on the the left right thing continuing. Uh, the way I would think more about that is the and because it's very germane to what you're saying is the idea of rendering what is implicit explicit, which I constantly say undermines. <laughs> um, our, our ability to appreciate the, the fullness of what it is. But then that having been explicated implicitness is once more reinfolded. Um, mm. And and this, this is something that also Bohm believed, that the implicit was made explicit, but it was then re-embraced. And as it happens, Nicholas of Cusa in the 15th century, great theologian and scientist, um, saw the same thing. So what I'm really saying there is that this explication, this unpacking with my left hemisphere, is not something I want to eschew, and I, I don't think I'd have been better to avoid it. What I like to say is that nobody has accused me of not using my right hemisphere so far, and I, I believe I'm, I'm an example, if you want one, of somebody who's tried to use both of them yeah. um, together. And I come from the realm of, of, of literature and music and all these things, and I point to examples throughout. So a lot of my approach is not, what I'm not doing, and I think this is sometimes misunderstood um, by philosophers, I'm not saying, so let's take Heidegger and unpack him endlessly for sort of 400 pages. Let me explain what's going on with Aristotle. I, I, that's not what I'm doing at all. What I'm doing is something more deictic. I'm pointing at a way that I can see, and I'm saying, and if you look at the history of philosophy, if you look at the history of great art and literature, you find expressions of it. And I, I hope that that makes it easier for people to understand in a more accessible, more metaphorical way, what I'm trying to um, unpack in a perhaps more theoretical way. Yes. Although, I mean, the curious thing, right, is that uh, is that it's quite easy to see the sense in which um, um, People like uh, uh, Nagarjuna or, who, or whoever or Heidegger are kind of um, uh, are sort of pointing at something. We've got to be careful with this idea of pointing because it could basically, you, as soon as you start talking about it, as soon as you start explicitating it, you fall back into the same kind of uh, uh, traps uh, again. Uh, but the the difference with your writing is that um, it's very <laughs> explicit, right? It, it it doesn't kind of feel so much like pointing it feels it feels a lot more like i'm being told how things are and again if if i give you a little quote from page yeah. six of uh of volume one of Ooh. the of the of um, the match with things um you say at the bottom of page six what we are dealing with are ultimately relations events processes things is a useful shorthand for those elements that again sounds to me as somebody not not really pointing at something but explicitating something and stating something i mean you've actually you actually use the word ultimately there it's, it seems to me it's as if mm. you're saying um um i am going to tell you um uh, what the ultimate truth is whereas as a wittgensteinian for example i would say look there, well, there's there's the ultimate truths and conventional truths as buddhism says are both truths and the ultimate comes from the everyday, and it always has to return uh, return to it. Whereas sometimes in your presentation, it makes it sound more like we can actually state what these ultimate things are, not just point to them and not just kind of reinfold them, but state them. Well, I'm just going to pull a blind and I'm, I'm coming back. Yes, you've got a beautiful <laughs> evening up north there. Definitely glorious. And it's probably going to go on like this for about 11 or 12. Um, yes. Um, well, uh, what I tried to do in the first pages of the book 
is anticipate for the reader things that they may um, hope to get to understand later. So I, I'm not so much stating them as, as a truth that just are, but saying that these are the conclusions that I will be coming to. I believe that ultimately um, that relations are prior to Renata, and I'm not alone in that. Um, amongst that doesn't philosophers. sound like a pointing at something, right? That sounds like a statement. Well, no, it isn't, but it may be difficult to satisfy you because um, obviously if I stated nothing um, as having more truth than something else, you'd be pissed off and want your money back. So everybody wants oh, no, me to be I'm saying not something. I'm pissed off when I read Wittgenstein. Well, good, neither am I. But, <laughs> but, Wittgenstein, but Wittgenstein does suggest that, for example, certain kinds of philosophizing are less fruitful than certain others. Otherwise, yeah. he, he wouldn't have been writing his work. So Absolutely. what I'm really doing is, is saying that certain positions, certain ways of looking, certain ways of attending, um, are more revealing than others. And uh, as I say early on, I emphatically do not belong to the school that truth is just something we make up. Um, if we don't really believe there's any kind of truth that's accessible, we might as well all just stay in bed um, and, and starve. Um, so I do believe that there is truth. I believe passionately that it matters. I don't believe that any one human being is ever going to be in possession of the truth, but that our goal is to get closer to something that calls to us, that reaches into something quite deep in us, and we respond to it, we answer to it. It's an, in other words, again, it's a relationship. It's something that calls to which we respond, and it responds to us. And I believe that most of the things that are important to understand are misunderstood in conventional Western philosophy, or some of it anyway, and certainly in science, by being posited as things. And mm -hmm. you know that's why I have this problem with things, because it immediately sets you off on a certain way of approaching it, whereas I think to approach it as a two-way relationship or as a process is more profitable. And, and that's why I, I think it's important to, to understand when I say um, things are an acceptable shorthand, what I'm saying is things are a way we now conceive things, but they're not, I believe, the best way. Yeah, and and I also show the history of thing as coming from relationships, causes, matters of discussion between people, whereas it's come to mean latterly something quite different, mm. a, a, a solid object. Mm. Thank you, Ian and Rupert. Um, I'm sorry to stop you, Midflow, because you're uh, Rupert. You've done exactly what I, you know, had hoped you would. You've drilled down very thoroughly into one specific inquiry. Um, and I always wanted that for these sessions, that we stay focused. Mm. And you've done that commendably well and doggedly. And Ian, you've handled the questions with the great Alan as usual. Um, in a minute, I'm going to let everyone else ask a question. But first of all, I want to just remind people, while you're getting your question ready, a few things to note. Um, I'll ask a question. <laughs> while I'm asking a question, you can... Um, get your own one ready. So keep questions pertinent to tonight's event. This is very important. I mean, Ian has a big fan club now, but lots of people want to ask Ian their question for Ian. But we're really keen um, to the point of strongly encouraging that um, you focus on the discussion as you've heard it tonight, including the question I'm about to ask, which we might be able to follow on from. Um, we'll try and alternate between men and women. So we just want to to bring that balance in as a design principle as far as possible. And um, when you ask a question, put it in the chat and raise your hand if you can do both. We appreciate it. It really helps us. Uh, it might not look like it to you, but when we're trying to scan across 250 odd people, it makes a bit, big difference if you do both. Um, and we will then try and spotlight you and um, we'll draw on questions, not simply on first come, first serve. We have a certain filtering process based on interest and relevance to tonight's discussion. So with that thought... Jonathan, you, may, may, yeah. sorry, have I, I don't want to interrupt you. Have you finished that? Um, um, if it's on a point of order, like like that kind of thing, then it would be timely. Is well, it, it, it was no, no, probably not on exactly a point of order, but it was just uh, two things that arose out of what you said that I thought were relevant. <clears throat> One is that um, if people want to put questions to me, 
for example, last week I did a whole Q&A session. It's only open to members, but if you become a member, one of the things you get is to be able to put questions to me. Right. And, and the other thing was just to say that I wonder if we should comment on the fact that this session was billed as, are we involved in a war on yeah. nature? I'm coming to that, yeah. Or, or okay. Okay. on life. Or, or, um... So, so this is the this is the thing. I'm um, I'm a little torn here with the time we have left. So, there's the philosopher in me is is quite excited because I can sort of see what is at stake for Rupert, and why this sort of matters vis-a-vis -vis the premise of your work. And I was also reminded of you know I've got my galley copy here of the of the Master and His Emissary, which was you know pre-publication from back in the Ooh. day. And right at the <laughs> end there, yet as you may remember, because people keep on asking you about it you refer to the possibility that the whole thing may just be metaphorical and not necessarily grounded in the brain and but there that wouldn't necessarily be such a bad thing and i, I want to ask you about that but i'm not going to because i want to focus on something else but all these things are arising for me um what i'm interested to ask actually now um given the title of the event and given what rupert's focused on i want to initially ask rupert in as plain language as possible please what's at stake for you in this discussion what, why are you so keen to clarify this issue of relationship to truth and relative veridical strength of the hemispheres? Um, but maybe if I can put a gloss on that, you as a philosopher uh, with a particular view of the world think the idea of progress is problematic in general, the idea of societal progress, civilizational progress you think that causes a lot of harm as i understand it yeah and it'd be worth mentioning that however even if you think that and you can ideally if you can explain to us why you think that does it follow that we can't have progress in philosophy and what is your general feeling about ian's claim that he has made progress in philosophy are you inclined to say and this is putting you on the spot and i know you're friends with ian and so on but are you inclined to agree that he has or are you not so sure so that was the how I wanted to move it. And then from there, if we can sort of get, get back to this question of war against life, is there something about the war against life that arises from how we attend to the world that isn't, that is at stake in the, the technicalities of what you were trying to get Ian to clarify tonight? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So why does it uh, matter? Um, because, uh, Ian has opened up some incredibly important space to do with uh, what kind of um, civilization uh, we are and what kind of civilization we need to become. Uh, and and I'm reminded here, of course, of Wittgenstein's wonderful um, remark, um, one day perhaps this civilization will become a culture, uh, <laughs> which for him is a great term, uh, term of praise, culture. Um, <laughs> And we need to get as clear as we can uh, about um, what this critique of civilization is and, uh, and what a civilization might uh, look like, um, which was genuinely different. So one of the things obviously I've been trying to do is sort of worry that there's something a little bit Manichaean, i.e. possibly a little bit left hemispherical, ironically, about the dichotomy between the right and the left hemisphere and the way uh, Ian sometimes develops it, um, to worry that um, Ian's way of approaching this, and obviously it's a way I'm very familiar with and can engage in myself as well, um, is highly explicitizing and uh, analytical and so forth. Um, and to draw our attention to ways of doing it such as perhaps Wittgenstein's, perhaps Heidegger's, perhaps Nagarjuna's, perhaps Vazabandu's, which are not so much uh, like that. Um, and one of the things I've, I've written in, in my um, reviews of Ian's incredible books is that um, I think it would be good to uh, spend more time um, uh, looking at and practicing and using uh the capacities of the so-called uh right hemisphere um by way of of things like um meditation uh myth making um spending time uh, in nature uh doing um cultural uh politics um in ways that um 
don't always um, fall out directly from what Ian does. And in terms of this question of progress, I mean, Wittgenstein's worry was that uh, when we look for progress in philosophy, what we're looking for is the kind of thing that our civilization calls um, progress, and that that kind of thing is highly problematic. Uh, and I am concerned that when we uh, reach for saying things like, um, um, well, um, processes are uh, realer or truer uh, than things, or um, when we um, seem to uh, not to be willing to um, allow uh, the left hemisphere um, uh, uh, a sort of permanent role uh, and uh, a, a truths of its own, um, then we may be, as uh, uh, as a Buddhist might put it, um, attaching to the right hemisphere um, and uh, not recognizing that the problem with what Ian calls the left hemisphere is not itself, but our attachment to it or our desire to our inclination to uh attach uh to it uh and that um yeah i i think that's sufficient to to motivate an answer to your question it is um although i'm noticing something very interesting in the chat which feels like it's worth responding to um there's a sort of detection of bias um by rupert and and by extension myself i think as well um against Ian oh. and just to clear it that's you know given they might we've <laughs> no, invested no, I don't. In, yeah invested I, I don't in promoting Ian's work and 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 so on I think Ian's aware no, no, that's no. not the case however it does beg the question because I and I, I may, may come in here there's a part of me and Ian I think Rupert's I'm possibly speaking for Rupert, Rupert here but maybe not there is mm. a part those who come to understand Ian's work well and I really have spent many hundreds of hours with it um at some level you you almost want it to be axiomatic right you want to say look guys here's your theory of reality um we can use that as first principles um and we sort of start building and learning from that basis and then okay of course there's all sorts of caveats and qualifications and and ian would be the first to bring them to bear but nonetheless there's something of that spirit about it it's like this is something like the truth let's build on it right but then the philosopher in you says, are you sure? Because you're trained for years at university to be skeptical. And this is where it comes in. We're really just steel manning is the term they're using in culture these days, trying to steel man Ian's argument to see, yeah. is this really the case? Yes. So for instance, as I read Rupert's question, what I'm hearing is you have at least three variables. You have um, the left hemisphere under clinical conditions, you have the right hemisphere under clinical condition conditions, and you have the whole person outside of clinical conditions, and then you have the whole of society, you have four at least. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Ian's work is a tapestry weaving together the relationships between these things. And there are times when it reads very persuasively, but then when it comes to actually wanting to build on it, um, you want to be sure that it's really, you know, it's like that chair you're standing on to reach in the top shelf. You want to just be sure that it's not going to buckle mm, under you. Mm. So that's how I see the passion of Rupert's inquiry and why it's not irrelevant to the war against life. But for the sake of the audience, it would be good to get to why, why Ian, are we even talking about a war against life? What does that even mean? Well, perhaps I could just comment briefly on what's been said by both of you. Um, first thing was that a shudder went down my spine when I heard you utter the words, Ian's claim that he can uh, has made progress in philosophy. Those are not words I think you'll find I've ever uttered. The most I may have said is, um, I hope it's not <clears throat> hubris for me to think that I may have uh, uh, taken a step forward in philosophy. And I think that's very different because, to coin a phrase, the how is as important as the what. And um, I'm not making a, a grand claim, I'm making a tentative claim, and I want to know what people think. Um, again, on progress, I mean, uh, Rupert and I entirely share um, our view that progress is a modern fantasy in relation to our society and a delusional one. But it doesn't mean that there can be no progress in any way in, in our intellectual world, of course not. Um, on the things that Rupert mentioned that, uh, you know, might turn out to be 
very useful, like mindfulness and spending time in nature and so on. Anyone who follows me will know that I talk about all these things. Um, uh, and so there's no, no, no divide between us on that either. Um, and I think that at the end of what Rupert said, he, he said, well, it's not so much that um, there's something wrong with the left hemisphere, it's the, the wrongness is in our attachment to it. Well, he's just, again, spoken <coughs> exactly what I'm saying, that it's a good servant, it has a very important role, I never denied that, but it is not a good one in terms of wisdom. It, it's not, it, it can't know as much as the right hemisphere, it's not set up to do so. So, uh, in a way, I feel I'm having to revisit what you call McGilchrist 101, but maybe these things have to be repeated. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I, I, I do agree with you that it's very useful to have them tested or okay. steel manned, as you say. Yeah. Okay. If I could make on a, the, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, on the, on the war against life, because I think we've got a big chorus of demand mm. for, from the audience to... Yes. There was the, the way well, we, we, bit, we, just very quickly, the reason we advertised it as such... <clears throat> our perspective, Perspectiva's perspective, is that I happen to know Ian that at one point that was a perspective title for the book. Mm. And good to understand why you thought it was potentially a good title and why you chose in the end not to use it. The War on Life, yes. Well, you know, I can't summarize very briefly. Well, I can. I can, I can say sort of points or sort of things. I do feel that if I wanted to pinpoint something that I see has been happening during my lifetime. It has been an increasingly motivated, increasingly aggressive assault on, on nature. That we find the problem with nature is we didn't make it, we didn't plan it, it's got rules of its own. Mm. And those rules limit us in some way. And we are damned if we're going to be limited. We've bought into the idea that freedom is to do whatever we want, however destructive it is, however much it, it is entering into territory, the consequences of which we really don't know. We should be allowed to do it because that's what freedom is. Well, freedom may not be the greatest value anyway, but if freedom is important, and I think it's certainly important, freedom is not to be able to do everything you want. It's to allow and to pursue a way in which your values will become aligned with those that will lead to human flourishing. That is true freedom. Yeah. And so I can point to many things around the world in the newspapers, in current affairs and so on, that seem to me to have this shape of an envious attack on anything that we haven't fabricated according to our theory. And this is very like the stories of, of um, Lucifer, of Faust, of Frankenstein or whatever. You know, these images have been rattling away in the human psyche for a long time, and now they're actually coming about. Okay, Ian, I'm keen to bring others in. Um, we, we haven't yes. quite, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start just because um, it's difficult to choose. I'm going to start with Dave Pendle just because I, I know. Can, can you just can you just hang on a moment because I've I've got a a cold. My voice is going, and I'm just going to get some more water. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. We can, um, Rupert. You and I can have a brief chat while Ian's away. Mm. Um, to remind 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 us again what 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 you're getting because we know I, I've seen you know I see you talking about climate change with great passion. I see you on Sky News, BBC, and so on. Uh, and clearly you care about the world and the our survival on it. But somehow tonight you, you've chosen to go somewhere different. Now, I find that fascinating because I know your history and your commitment, but the audience might be a little confounded. So I'm, I just, when you get a moment, maybe not immediately, because I want to get to the question. Well, I can say something very quick about that. Very quick, if you can. Uh, maybe it's a sort of uh, uh, la charade of, uh, of philosophizing. Right. Uh, maybe I'm getting it all out of my uh, <laughs> right. out of my uh, out of my system before maybe. I actually leave. But slightly more seriously, also just to to add that uh, I do believe what I said uh, five ten minutes or so. Uh, ago, that uh, what Ian's offering is potentially such a kind of profound set of interventions about 
what's gone drastically wrong with our civilization. Some of you will know that my most, uh, my best-selling book uh, ever is called This Civilization is Finished uh, and what a better civilization could uh, could look like. That's why I think it's really important to, uh, to steal man, uh, the, the whole idea um, from among other things, a philosophical and a, a broadly spiritual perspective. And I hope to have done some of that this evening. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, Dave, you can go first on the questions and relatively brief if you can. Dave Pendle, thanks. Mike, have you, Michael, have you got him? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, obviously, we're talking about a world or a civilization that's in decline and, and through human impact. And um, I'm very much on the, uh, my whole life has been dedicated more to the right brain and exploring a mysticism and and inquiry and that sort of thing uh, but i feel the necessity and urgency of more extreme action i haven't joined extinction rebellion uh, where i'm living but i'm inclined to go that way because uh, the response the kind of public response to the moment seems to fall so much far short of what's required so I had a question about, um, you know, if activism is to be informed by the right, right brain, does it need to get more extreme, or is there another route uh, in terms of meeting the um, requirement of the time? Well, can I make a little start on that, and then Ian may wish to mm, to, sure. to join in. Sure. Um, so. Uh, it's great that you're so uh, so passionate as we all um, should be. Um, it is also worth spending um, quite a bit of time um, figuring out what's actually uh, effective. Uh, my own view is that what we accomplished um, in Extinction Rebellion in 2019, uh, and, and Ian, by the way, was a, a supporter on the sidelines back then, um, which was wonderful, um, was, was really important, but that uh, there's an open question to put, to say the least, about whether what the radical flank is now offering is continuing to be effective or indeed whether some of it is being uh, counterproductive. Um, and one thing that you might wanna check in with um, is uh, the way in which quite a lot of activism is motivated by anger. And anger is an energy and anger is important and anger is all part of the, the whole and of the process. But if we get motivated more by anger than by grief or anxiety or um, love, which is at the root of it all, then we're likely to be making a strategic error. And this, of course, connects with Ian's wonderful observation that um, of all the emotions, anger is the one that lateralizes most to the left hemisphere. Yes, lateralizes most and lateralizes to the left. Yes. Um... I agree really with with um with all of that i won't take up much time but just to say that it, uh, as hinted i did actually take part in a in a in an extinction rebellion um event in a small way in in hyde park um and i'm torn i think that um, i agree really with rupert that at a certain point it was effective it could now become counterproductive but in defense of my own um emphasis more on on writing and talking one way i think that a lot can change is by moving people's spirit more than by simply saying we have a crisis and uh, as i often say we, we could save the world uh, if, if if that's really possible from extinction and, and all the rest but if we did it without changing our hearts and minds it wouldn't really matter and, and I think that what happens is we only need a small percentage of people, perhaps only 5% of people, to take on board what I'm trying to put across about the right hemisphere. That in itself would help motivate policy change and so on. So I'm doing my little bit, that's all I say, <laughs> sitting up here on this irrelevant island. <clears throat> oh. Okay, I've slightly lost track of um, the questions because we had hoped to alternate uh, men, women, as we mentioned. Um, Leila Hatoum, do you still have a question? If you're there, we can unmute you and... Yes, hello. And Great, thank, thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, uh, 
Ian McGillicrest, I have your um, The Matter with Things, and I haven't finished reading it, but I've gotten so much out of it, as well as your talks, and thank you, uh, Rupert. But I feel like, um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding you, I, I was really more resonating with Ian than Rupert, no offense taken, but I felt like everything that he was kind of, I don't want to say attacking, but saying that he was not saying, I feel like he said it in his book and various different pages. So I don't know if you skimmed his book or if you were just picking out certain Whoa. things. Because... Hang on a minute. So as Jonathan pointed out <laughs> at the start of this, I've written uh, detailed reviews of, uh, of, uh, mm. of Ian's books. Okay. And very generous, Tutorable. very generous reviews. Okay, yeah. okay, so I, I thought that you, time with them. Okay, so then maybe correct me, maybe I'm misunderstanding and I'm way out there on the metaphysical realm, um, trying to understand this biology that he's, he's giving, because I saw him as saying that when we only use one side of the brain or the other, if we don't use that, you know, like you're talking about the Buddhist, but that higher state of intention with this intellectual left side then we really lose ourselves and we can't help this war on society we can't become better human beings we cannot really live up to our highest potential because the intelligent side is not enough you need that higher uh, that imaginative side of the right brain and on page i don't want to read it but on page 12 11 um, I feel like he really talks about that beautifully on understanding um, how to accept that divine with the imagination and that uh, intellect together. So I just, I don't know, maybe I'm being overprotective with uh, Ian, even though I don't know him. <laughs> I've kind of been following him and uh, also Bernardo and Rupert and all of you guys. So I appreciate everybody, but um, I feel like he was kind of misunderstood on this. And I, I, I don't know. So no. okay, am I wrong in understanding what you were saying, uh, Ian, I guess is my question. Sorry, I went too long. That's okay. Thank you very much, Leila. Um, Ian or Rupert, do you have anything? I, I have something to say in Rupert's defense, but Ian, do you have anything to add? Well, I have things to say in Rupert's defense as well. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think we know them. You, you say them. Uh, I didn't feel attacked. I thought we were undergoing the usual process of um, philosophical discussion. Yeah. And I found it interesting and, and um, you know, I don't want to go so, on anymore um, and, and use, up, use up time. Okay, so um, William Blake, opposition is true friendship. Anyway, yes. next question, um, Niles Hoffman. Niles, are you hearing us? Can we, uh, we can unmute you are. Yes. <clears throat> it's not Niles, it's oh, Nils. Nils, I'm Davis, Nils, like Nils Bohr. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm not a Nils Bohr. Um, I, <clears throat> I have uh, asked questions to Ian before, and I agree with all Ian's writing, um, but uh, I come from a different perspective. At the moment, I'm reading Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, and I learn in brackets, feel up the phenomenology of, of mind. Uh, my question was, Is what is the relationship between spirit and mind in the Hegelian sense? I think we have missed what Hegel actually means, because I think Hegel was a, a right hemisphere of spiritual thinker. And, and this is the issue, and I think if we can understand him, then that would be a big step forward to saving the world and, and everything, because that that is absolute uh, reality well, he talked about. And I think we have, the left hemisphere yeah. has missed, understood Hegel. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Ian, for, 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 what it's worth, for what it's worth, I've learned a lot from Hegel, and I broadly agree that his philosophy um, is resonant with my view that um, you know, of how how the brain operates. So I'm with you, and I, I use Hegel quite a bit in my work. Okay, Th and Rupert, anything to add on Hegel briefly? No. Thanks. no. no. Okay, so um, we'll take another question quickly then um, from Shane uh, 
Korotowski. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, two things I kind of picked up on this uh, conversation is at the beginning about social justice being kind of more of a left hemisphere um, approach, which, you know, is debatable. And, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, but also about how, you know, as we discuss the divided brain more explicitly, are we at risk of, of kind of almost making those divisions maybe worse, or maybe I misunderstood that. But I guess my question is, you know, I'm in Canada, the country is on fire from coast to coast to coast. And it seems like, you know, I guess woke is the term now used instead of identity politics used by the media and, and many conservative critics. And it's taking attention away from the climate crisis. And, and we're not just failing on this from a mitigation standpoint, as in, you know, how can we reduce emissions if people really believe we should? It's about adaptation. Like, you know, we're we're gonna have to change the way we do a lot of things. Building codes, insurance companies are starting to stop insure people in, in California. Like, you know, things are changing quite fast. Yeah. And when I look at, you know, Canada, uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, I, he is a person and you know I've, I've listened to some of your talks with him ian and i i don't mm. like things are getting better like it seems like we're we're, we're you know that we're at a point now where conservatives want to legislate anti-woke policies like just to quote ron DeSantis, in florida put your question today. please shane because we don't have that yeah, much so, so i i guess how do we make progress like how do we make progress or do, well, this doesn't well, seem like we're, uh, we're, we're there's a too progress. big a question for me i'm going to hand over to rupert I, yeah <laughs> i can take that one um look uh <laughs> you are absolutely right that uh, the we're in a desperate uh situation and um it's beyond desperate really it's it's very hard to 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 state how, how bad it is however bad you think it is it's almost certainly uh worse um however it doesn't seem to me that the way we should respond to that is best done through the lens of uh wokeness uh i much much prefer the uh, much older term of awakening right and that's what uh, the great uh, wisdom traditions speak of which i was trying to allude to at various points in my remarks during the dialogue with uh, with ian uh, we need to awaken but what is called woke uh, is not at all the same thing as being awakened it's a particular position uh, on of yeah, yeah. a particular version of egalitarianism and social justice uh, philosophy yeah. uh, or uh, usually a very angry one I think that identity politics is uh, hmm. is highly problematic. This whole thing um, is, uh, as you perhaps implied, uh, a distraction. Uh, I don't favour what the wokists are saying. I don't favour what Jordan Peterson is saying. But what we actually need to do is to focus on well, the, the war against life, uh, and get serious about uh, about tackling that. And in order to do that, we need to depolarize. And that's what the Climate Majority Project is trying to do. Uh, it's incredibly hard, but uh, without it, there is, it seems to me, uh, definitely no hope because they will uh, distract us uh, endlessly from the real profound uh, challenges of our time. Um, this is um, a, a bit difficult to say, but my cat sounds as though it's being killed by another cat. So I will just step out for two minutes. I'd like to say I completely agreed with everything you said, um, Rupert, and it's just so difficult, isn't it, to say anything without being misunderstood. I did not say, excuse me, that social justice was left hemisphere in some utterly reductive way. What I was trying to suggest is that social justice is a fantastically complicated issue and takes in many, many, many strands of thinking about what a society is and therefore can't be summed up in that sort of a way. But I do think that the social justice warriors are deeply problematic and exemplify to me, perfect um, non-function of the right hemisphere. Everything is left hemisphere about it. But I'm just going to go and try and rescue my cat. Ian, while you do that, Ian, we're actually going to... <laughs> uh, Ian has 
utterly beautiful cats, I can attest. So I can see why he wants to rescue them. Um, okay, then, what, since we'll take a few minutes till Ian gets back. So there's two Pauls with questions, hands up. Um, we'll go with Paul McGinn first, please. And we'll try and keep it brisk and end in about three minutes. So quickly, Paul. And yeah, actually, cool. You could ask your question and then let Paul Baker ask his question just after. And we'll have to answer them together. Okay, so Paul McGinn first, please. Uh, so my question was when Ian was talking about the mountain behind uh, the Batters Hill um, being like a wave. Um, does a lack of understanding of natural processes in a wider time frame than our own lives have any impact on the war that we're, that we're having on life? Um, so not understanding, um, mm. you know, like there's a thing from Pythagoras uh, that I've written down here, like uh, physical matter is music solidified. So kind of just going into that kind of yeah yeah I that, don't know we thank you, we are very you... very focused on what's happening now and we don't have so much of a broader picture um, yes, from right. institutions which are kind of gone a little bit more left hemisphere orientated and taking this step back to see the bigger okay. picture um, in that respect. Thank you, Paul. And then second, Paul, quickly, please, Paul Baker, if you could ask a quick question, and then we'll we'll let the Ian and Rupert round off. There we go. Uh, Michael, is he unmuted? There I've we go. Asked Paul to unmute. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I had a very long question, making it very short. There are <laughs> two. There seem to be two. One environmentalist, uh, for instance, Bjorn Longberg talks about an enormous number of problems and trying to get a sense of their priority. And there's another sort of environmentalist which says climate change is the one big issue and the carbon dioxide is the key thing. And I said, I wonder which is more right brain and which is more left brain. Okay, great. <laughs> so there's two questions there. One about the, with reference to the mountain behind you being a very slow process here and, and music solidified in Pythagorean terms. And that relevance mm. of that to the war against life. And the second question about the relative emphasis of different kinds of environmentalists and what that says mm. about the hemispheric mm. emphasis. Um, well, I, 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 I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure that everything has to, um, you know, necessarily be t labeled according to a hemisphere. But I, I do think that... Um, what the, the 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 idea that matter is a kind of uh, frozen music uh, 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 or, or composed of music is is another example of a truth which is not necessarily being put as the truth. In fact, I think Pythagoras was rather careful to say very little and to state very little. So, but it is another example of how it is possible to be moved to think differently about. The material world by somebody who has made this connection with the nature of music. Um, uh, on the other matter, I think um, I, I would make a distinction, as does uh, Dougal Hine, between predicaments and problems. Problems are things that can be sorted out and have solutions which are uh, finite and, and implementable. Predicaments are situations that are complex and have grown up over time and may have no answer. I mean, in one predicament is that we're mortal and there's nothing to be done about that. Um, thank goodness. Uh, and um, so uh, w w what I would say is that it's not good enough to think about any one of these problems as just a bit of bad luck that turned up. We were doing so well and then, oh goodness, the climate changed and the seas turned, it out, turned out to be poisoned and all that. No, w these things are not bad luck. They're not separate problems. They're part of the predicament we've got into by adopting a toxic way of thinking about who we are and what the world is and how we relate. And that's due to, in my view, adopting this very uh, grasping, possessive, power-seeking left hemisphere approach. Yeah, I, I meant to that. I, I, I was seeking to suggest earlier that the problem is really with the, the grasping, uh, if you will, more than with the, the left hemisphere as such. But uh, I'm in agreement with the broad thrust, very much what Ian just said. It's crucial to perceive climate uh, as simply the canary in the coal mine of a more general ecological uh, breakdown and of a um, civilizational uh, crisis uh, that we're in, which um, is very much a predicament, not a, a problem. Um, 
on what the first Paul said, yeah, absolutely. The the uh, the long view, the long durée, as it were, um, can give us uh, a wonderful perspective that too often in our uh, ordinary little lives um, we lack. Um, what I was getting at in my um, raising of a, a doubt about that quotation from Ian's book was simply that if we uh, assert the superiority of the perspective that comes from um, that kind of uh, long view, then we are, it seems to me, um, reconstituting the problematicness of uh, a kind of dogmaticness that he attributes to uh, the left hemisphere. Uh, and we ought to recognize the the, the perfect uh, viability and uh, okayness of, um, of everyday views, of uh, presence, of regarding mountains as mountains, um, et cetera, provided that those perspectives don't assert their absoluteness. Thank you, Rupert. Mm -hmm. um, we've normally been quite disciplined about our timing, but this is the last event for a while. <laughs> and also I sense a certain rising of energy. So I'm just gonna take one more question from Anne. Um, and Ode Odell, I think it is. And yes. See where that takes us. Thank you. Hi. Such Hello. a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. And there, there's nothing more fascinating about, you know, our left and right hemispheres um, of our brain. Um, I suggest that for full integration, we should we should think about bringing the body into the conversation. Um, I think I've always felt that, you know, we're, we're not in embodying conversations enough. Uh, and I don't really know how to express it all. But what I would say is um, recently I've listened to several neuroscientists um, speak, TED Talks or whatever. They, uh, they bring up William James, a purely disembodied emotion is a non-entity. Um, Antonio Damasio uh, talks mm. about the fact that you know, AI and machine learning, they'll never surpass us really because you truly need an an organic body yeah. to, to mm -hmm. fully, mm -hmm. you know, embody and understand and to, to bring values. So, um, so Ian, to your point, or, or to both of your points about right and left brain, perhaps if mm -hmm. we bring body more into the quotient, we bring more integration and it actually yeah. might help the right side to become more of to 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 gain ground on on the left side so i, I think it's about that, let's have a holistic conversation using the body with the brain that's i'm not sure what my question is but i know you'll say something wonderful <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Anne. um it's very germane to both questions and one about the attack on nature and on uh, uh, and the hemisphere conversation and it's the thing that i always emphasize is that one of the aspects of the way we think now and act and behave is we act as though we were disembodied cognitive machines which we are not and all the really important stuff that we know is held in regions which are not fully conscious i mean the amount that we know and that influences us coming from our body is enormous compared with the amount that comes from our conscious mind. But uh, so that's true. Um, and uh, I always do think that it's very important to remember that our gut, uh, the human gut has more brain, uh, more neurons in it than the brain of a dog. And a dog is not a stupid animal. And the heart has many neurons that go back to the brain. Report, in medical school, they were an embarrassment. Nobody knew what they were there for. They didn't know what all this stuff in the gut was about, probably having a dump. That is not right. <laughs> There's far, far, far more going on there. And this is reporting to us on the state of the body. And just three things on the right hemisphere very quickly in the body. First of all, it's the one that has the body image, not the left. The right hemisphere is more in touch with the uh, body and its emotions through the right um, um, uh, cingulate cortex and the right um, frontal lobe in general. And it is also more in touch with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which governs our autonomic reaction. So in all ways, the right hemisphere is more geared up to context and the big context for us is body. The left hemisphere tends to shell that context. 
Yeah, I, I would add that uh, I think it's very helpful to uh, to return to the body for multiple reasons. But one reason is that uh, it reminds us of uh, the way that the right and left hemispheres are part of one uh, functioning organism, which is only a functioning mm. organism in the context of uh, a functioning uh, community and a functioning uh, ecosystem. Um, exactly. And uh, Ian has has taught us much about what happens when um, the right or left hemisphere gets uh, fragmented, um, and in particular mm -hmm. when the left hemisphere is is, uh, is a fragment, as it were, a part masquerading as a whole. Uh, ultimately, the really challenging um, thing that the kind of task that, in a way, Ian is engaged in, and certainly that uh, that Wittgenstein was engaged in, is the task of trying to describe. Uh, the being as a whole in the context of the community and the and in the context of nature mm -hmm. and that it seems to me is where we need to uh, let go of uh, of assertion and ultimately return to uh, practice and um uh poetry and uh, and other ways of uh, of if if you will uh, pointing rather than stating of course that was some very elegantly done rupert i feel like you sort of summarized your your prior argument in a in a, a more poetic way, in a, way in, a, in a more crowd pleasing way as well, <laughs> um, but managed to sort of get the last word, but in a way that Ian wouldn't mind because it was done so well and so graciously. But it was not only done so well, but I I, I agree. I go with every yeah, go with every word of it. Yeah. I know. And so I just like to reiterate that um, you know, I for one am uh, you know as somebody who's wrestled with Ian's work and tried to make sense of it, and often seeks to use it as a kind of premise in certain contexts um really value rupert's attempt to as a philosopher clarify where he was less comfortable with his work mm. and i'm aware that that mm. might have been for le for some people less well somewhat more strenuous than usual um but it was nonetheless invaluable um for those who are interested in really um giving ian the ian's work the rigorous attention it 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 demands and deserves so a very heartfelt thanks to Rupert Reed. Um, and of course, a thanks to Ian, who has um, been with us every week now for, well, every two weeks now for uh, eight weeks. Uh, sorry, um, two times eight is 16. Um, and um, thank you for the, for holding holding the course. Um, I hope your cats are OK. Um, yes, they are. Yes, they're fine. Great, great. Because they're, they're really are <laughs> Very important news flash. Cats okay. No, that's <clears> important. <throat> um, a little tiny like, bit no. of gossip that people may not know that um, just before the book came out, I went to Sky and Ian and I, Ian and I had a whole day long of interviewing about the oh, book before it came out. Yeah. And one tragedy is that we never managed to get the tapes. There's a long story there about the tapes going missing. Um, but the other tragedy is that in those radio recordings, while Ian was talking to me about his book, one of his cats was with him and he was stroking it at all times. So sadly, the world will not see that. But we can imagine it. And I'm just leaving it with that image because it's sort of both embodied and slightly poetic. And that seems to be where we end up. So listen, thanks all. Don't forget about us. Um, there's various things going on. One is there is a connection and inquiry session next week. Um, I'm not sure which or both of my colleagues, Michael and Lee, will be running that. But um, as we've been doing every week in between the Ian events, going in a bit more depth, focusing on key aspects of the conversation, sometimes looking at practices in relationship to what's been discussed, sometimes sharing poems. Thank you, by the way, Isabella, for that inter uh, intervention earlier. Um, and um, we'll also be coming back with lots of other perspective and material. We have various plans in the work between now and um, when we resume this series in the autumn uh, and we'll be updating you with dates and so forth and mm. speakers and we've noticed many of your suggestions and we will take them on board and try and bring them on as far as we can so listen all i can do now is thank you all um it's been a pleasure and uh i'm grateful for your attention and time and it's hard to clap for ian and rupert but in so far as you can um <laughs> please extend your applause to them thank can you can you unmute everyone okay. you, we can i think you, yeah, yeah go do yeah. it um michael thanks ian uh, thanks uh, jonathan yeah, everyone thank, you, thank you and i
Uh, and I, I just want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure to be with you, my friend. And, and thank you for the devotion you've taken to my work. So that, uh, oh, thank you. Nothing thank but you. thanks. And, and thank, you, Dave, uh, thank you, Jonathan, for organizing this series. Okay, there we go. Thank you, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank